I'm Christy Kagan. I live in Coolock. I had eight children. Five girls, three boys. I lost two of them in the stardust. I married, I was married to John, my next door neighbour. I loved him very much. He died six years after, with a shock of losing his two daughters. I knew him as a neighbour, but he walked in the Margaret Creek on the Crumbling Road with one of my brothers. And uh, we used to come down the road because he paddled a, a lad around the corner. And I was reading the book in the garden one day and he says to me, will you come out with me tonight? And I said, the pleasure is all yours. I forgot all about it. He came up to the door and he said he'd buy a suit. All done up, his quip and all. My sister, Lord Mason, at first came up and says, Chrissy, she says, John King is at the door, all done up. I said, what? He said, yeah. I went down. Uh, I said, where are you going? He says, you told me the pleasure was all mine, so we're going now. So I was only messing. And he was very annoyed. So I eventually got up. And I was at the end of August. And it was the second last day of his holidays when I met him. And he was going back. So he said, I'll write you. So he wrote me a letter anyway. It was very romantic. So I got that. I couldn't eat me dinner. All the nice things he was saying to me. So my father, Lord Mason, said, I suppose to you're not getting on to eat your dinner. And he came home on Christmas, the week before Christmas. And uh, he says, will you get engaged? And he said, what? And he went out with him three times and he was gone away. He turned around and he says, he, so he, my father's out in the back. So he went out and he says to my father, Lord Mason, and he says, Mr. Daly, can I have uh, your daughter's hand in marriage? And he said, what? What? And uh, he says, I look after so we wouldn't have and have a chat. So they had a chat in the house anyway, and he gave her permission. That was on the same week, week, Christmas week. And he came home the following April. And he, he said to my father, that, um, we're going to get married in August. And he said, uh, where's your home? He said, I have my place in England. He said, I don't need you to get her going over there. When I came home from Manchester, I had Antoinette and Mary Lord Masoner. John's brother had a flat in Cork Street, but he was buying a house in Dundrum, so he let us into the flat. So it seemed the people that lived next door to me said I was at the moving in, and there was people on the list for the grin there, so we had to get out then. I got a letter from the corporation saying that. Mm -hmm. I had uh, moved to uh, Coolock, and I brought my mother out, Lord Mays, you know. And she turned around and says to me, my God, she says, you're out of the country. It's terrible out here. I said, I love it. So I had Mary, Antoinette, and I had John, John Ballyfermit, and Martina, Father Mason, Lorraine, and then I had twins, Neville and Suzanne. And then each year after that, I had Damien. Mary was very good at school. She got um, the Cabbies Award and she won the overall student in third year. And Antonis was very good at it, typing and the writing, but she wants to leave school. She had a friend named Mary Kenny that was her, her pal in school as well. And like the two of them were very close together. But like in the Christmas time, they'd ask the sister, well, they go around the posh house, the sister in the school, the, the, in the Clash of Doula, would they go around the porch's house and collect for the poor, for the poor people, you know what I mean? And make up little hampers. When Mary got started in the tech, she had a diary. I only found, I don't know who found her after she died. It was up in the wardrobe. 
which was sound like that, what she wants to be, she would have liked to be a nun, but to look after handicapped children and things like that. You know, she just wants to help somebody. And she was always writing poems and reading upstairs all the time. She wasn't the one for going out dancing much, was she, Antonia? She used to, um, she wasn't really. She would, yeah, like, mm. we'd have little secret uh, things, like if, say, an event had happened, uh, say, one night up the stairs, or sorry, the Camelot or the Clare Manor, and I'd probably do something and Mary would say, right, okay, giving you a warning, let me man out the next time, and it'd be slipped to me, and I'd read, okay, right, I won't do it again. She was, like, that kind of person, she was, Oh, she was more than a sister, she was a great friend, really and truly, and Martina. Martina was going out with Ava. The two of them were very close. She taught the world to him, right, and she had written out a lovely Valentine card from the last Valentine that was put down as. She wrote that that night on the card, the Valentine card. Well, she loved that fashion, didn't she, Antonia? Yeah. And she used to go upstairs. She didn't even need makeup. And she'd do her hair. And then somebody say, there was a house at the back of us and there was a lot of boys in it. Um, I think he fancied me as I was out the back window. And she'd be at her back window. Okay. You know? Yeah. Little things like that. You, they meant a lot that time, you know? She was fashion, uh, like, that was our thing, right? The fashion, keep up to date right up to the night the stairs because she had went up with me that night to meet my friend and she's at the top of the corner and she says, I want to, I'm at the walking off without my belt. And I said, run back, I said, and get it. And she goes, no, if I go back, my mouth smell the smoke got me. So I says, right, I said, I'll run back and get her. You hold me cigarette. So she's standing there puffing away then. But she didn't want me to ever know that she was smoking. But we all done it. My father was at the building extension in the back and put an awful lot of effort into building that for us because he's, he's say like he's need a bit of privacy he's at that age now right? and there was five girls in one bedroom and then the three boys in the box room so my father was trying to make um like give me and Mary a little bit of independence and this extension down the back right was for us to have our friends in and sleep down there as well but it never happened John, he never liked Friday the 13th. And he said it that day. I said he'd go every Friday, the whole crowd to them. Oh, well, see, I'm telling you now, he, I, I'd rather them stay here. And I said to him, so you're very superstitious to go every Friday. But that particular Friday, that's what he said. It wasn't only that he had been down there, my mother was in a competition, singing competition with the ladies club. And my father had seen the inside of the stairs for the first time. Mm. And he said, I don't like this at all. He said, I don't like this. He said, this is not safe, just by looking around. And he told, he pleaded, don't go that night. He said, there's something about that place. He said, it's not safe down there. If there's a fire in there, he said, no one will get him. And he had said that just before the start has happened. Mm. So this particular Friday night, it was the disco competition for KTEL. And it had been a big thing for weeks. Everyone was talking about it and everyone was gone. So Mary went up for us and then I met, I walked up with Martina and met my other friend Helen and we went in from there and then we went in and we all sat in the North Alcove. We'd leave our coats in the cloakroom, our bags, but this particular night we didn't because we knew that there was a dancing competition on and we said we'd leave our coats and bags beside us because there was going to be so many there, right? at least we wouldn't be queuing up for our coats and bags. So we left them beside us that night. 
Helen Hemvy, um, my sister Mary Keegan and myself. We're dancing. Yeah, we were all dancing on the floor. And Martina had gone over to her boyfriend, right, David Martin, and then she came back, so we were all kind of dancing. The disco dance competition was just over. We were all dancing away, and my friend said, look over there, right? And I looked up at the ceiling, and I saw what I thought was the artificial smoke from the DJ coming across the ceiling. And I said, that's the DJ doing the special effects for the disco? And she goes, no, over there. And I looked, and there was a small little fire. The DJ made the announcement, right, everyone calm down. We have her under control. There's a small fire we have her under control. And with that then, right, the small fire became bigger. Right, and it was raging across the ceiling. So we decided to go over to North Alcove, get our coats and our bags. And we had them um, just six, six foot away from the door. And the whole thing was lashing across the room, or the fire. Coming all across the ceiling, and the ceiling started coming down. Stuff like and it was all melting stuff dripping down onto us from the roof, whatever was up there, it was all dripping down onto us. I remember, like, we were going, Oh god, this is horrible, and the smoke was getting thicker and thicker. And we were gasping for a bit, we couldn't even breathe. We were choking, and we were just so close to getting out, right? And next to all, all the lights went down, right? So we held onto one another's hands, we said, Right, we'd stay together, we'd get out, right? We'll all get out. And then with the panic of everyone, right, there was everyone rushing to get to the doors. We were pushed to the ground. And when we were pushed to the ground, people trampled on us. And the smoke just getting thicker and thicker and the, f the fire was actually coming down on top of us. My last words was, oh God, help us, please help us. And when I woke up, I started screaming, where's Mary and Martina? Where's all my friends, Helen and Mary, Mary Kenny, where are they all? And I was told, everyone is out, they're gone to the hospital. And I just remember there was a pile of sand or uh, soil. I don't even remember what it was, but I was boring that much, right? I put my hands into it and started putting it on my face and my hands to, to cool me down. And then an ambulance man came up to me and he said, you have to get in the ambulance. I said, no, I said, I'm looking for my sisters. He said, they're all gone. They're all gone to the hospital, he said. You have to go to the hospital. So I remember then getting into the ambulance and I was the last person getting in. And just when I sat at the door, the door was closed. There was a girl sitting this side of me in the ambulance. And I was kind of like nervous. I was looking around, right, because the ambulance was full. And one minute she was just there. And the next minute her head went like that onto my shoulder. So I stared on her whether she died. I just couldn't move. I was like terrified in the ambulance. Uh, I was woke up at 20 to 4. My husband's at the running out of car. He's at turning around and saying, the stardusts have to be born to the ground. Where's the girls? I said, they're not in. So I must be waiting up for my daughter in the chipper. So he says, get, get, get dressed for going down to stardust. So I stepped out for it, into where I got out. And when I went down, I nearly died. I nearly fell through the floor. As all you could see was all frames, the tubular chairs. And I went down to the, told us all to go down to the police station. I went down to the police station. And he said, um, you can go to City Mark. When that happened first, I just went up to the hospital to see her and I passed her bed. I didn't know her, she was all bandaged up and her face was all black. And she called ma'am and she's just, just ma'am, so I just seen her teeth and I said, there's an internet to my husband. And I came back and I said, she said, where's Mary and Martina? And I said, Mary's in the mate and Martina's in the mother. I was in there for two and a half weeks. I heard the priest came in, like my mother and father, they were coming to the hospital. And they were changing from their funeral clothes to their ordinary clothes. And I was asking how's Mary and Martina because I had been told that they survived and they were okay. And when my mother and father would be coming, I'd say, how's Mary? And my mum said, oh, she's grand. She was asking for you. I didn't want to upset her. Her brain was bad. So I said, I'm at the losing two, I'm not going to lose three. You know, sometimes she wouldn't even talk to me. She'd say, well, ma, you know, she a whisper. Sorry. Yeah, because she's swallowed some of the smoke. I was worried because I thought my mum and dad was going to give out to me because Mary and Martina was dead and I had promised my father that I'd look after them. And that is the thing that I have had to live with, right? The guilt 
I know my mother and father never blamed me for Mary Martina's deaths. But I've always had that guilt because I survived and they didn't. And it's like a living nightmare. That was a living hell that I was in that night in the Stardust and my sisters. Like, just remember so clear the whole lot was coming down on top of us, the flames everywhere. It was just horrible. I'd never, ever, ever want to experience that. I never want anyone to experience that. It was a nightmare. My mother and father began gone home. And then one day a priest came in and he just came in to me and he says, what's your name? And I said, Santana. Santana, what I sent in the key and he goes, oh, that's right, he said. You, he said, your two sisters died, they were buried. And I said, no, they weren't. I said, they're in the matter and the mate. And he said, no, he said, they were buried. They're, they're dead. And I screamed the place down. With that, my father and my mother came in. And my father saying I was hysterical. And he said to me, what's wrong with you? And I said, there's a priest on you to be in here. I said, and he said, tell me that Mary and Martina is dead. And my dad says, what? And he went, ran, ran all around Dr. Stevens' hospital looking for the priest. He couldn't find him. But he just, it was disgusted over like a priest coming in and saying, oh, that's right. And even though when I said, no, they're not, they're in the matter in the maid, he kept saying, no, no, they're dead, they're dead. So with that then, I remember running out Dr. Stevens' hospital down the uh, fire escape and I had a nightdress on me at the time and I entered along the quay. And the porter at the hospital came back in and he brought me back in. And then that night, I think it was the next day I was coming home and I had a dream. And the dream was that if I go to the graveyard and I lay on top of the grave, that Mary and Martina come back in the way. And the following day my father came up and brought me home. And I insisted on him bringing me to the graveyard. And I just said to my dad, I said, I have to lie down here because Mary and Martina's going to come back. And he said, they're not answering, they're dead. They're not going to come back. Our Father up in heaven, our Lord up above, please guide and protect the guy that I love. Keep him from danger, save him from fear. Show me the way his actions to steer. You know, Lord, I love him with all my heart, so keep us together, never to part. But if this guy should ever leave me, when he gets to heaven, please tell him from me, I love him forever. But if I am first to rise above, please give him a message, a sign of love, written in marker, pen, sorry, sealed with a kiss. His name is David, the guy that I miss when you're not around.